Hi, this is Liz Cook, and this is Core Awareness. This is my podcast. And today I have Kimberly Ann Johnson, who is a birth doula and a mom, and the author of The Fourth Trimester. And she created a wonderful podcast series and uh, lots of great information you can uh, find on megamama.com. And she's the co founder of a stream school for postpartum care. But what I'm here to talk about uh, with Kimberly is the part of your work that's uh, called Activating Your Inner Jaguar. Um, I'm really interested in the embodied consent, the healthy boundaries, and what you call the real world understanding of your nervous system. And I'm going to read something from that uh, part of her website. Activating your inner Jaguar has to do with how we love, how we show up for relationships, how we parent, and how we deal with money or don't deal with it, and how we do sex. So, uh, welcome, Kimberly. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really glad you're here. And so I want to jump into some of the ways that we interface with SOAS, uh, nervous system, what you call inner Jaguar, I call rewilding SOAS. We're both on the seem to be on the same page around this paradigm of uh, know that we have an inner knowing, that we have a deep sense of safety and embodiment that is our animal body. And that when we're really listening to that, um, then we access a biointelligence that really moves us through the world or expresses our true kind of soulful journey here in a way that uh, can often be controlled by an overculture. So I find you unique in the embodiment world because you're not trying to calm, you're not trying to center, not that you don't speak about those things, but you're also looking to activate something and awaken something. So speak to, speak to that. Mm. Yeah, I found that, um in the work that I've done with women primarily that most women when they were coming to me to heal from birth traumas or sexual traumas that they were most of the time in flight responses or freeze responses and me as a longtime yoga practitioner and meditator I didn't realize that I was taking a freeze response that I already had and then sort of reshaping it into something that also was good and also meant uh, that I was, yeah, that it was really related to goodness, this idea that I had something to earn to be good, um, which I really went all the way down to this summer when I went to a rebirthing uh, training and I re recognized that my own desire to be good came in the very first moments and months of my life uh, because I, had, I was a difficult birth and I was a difficult baby, um, so my mom told me, and um, I was difficult to nurse and all of those things um, made me want to be good. So as I worked with more and more women, I saw, well, the problem, like, yoga nidra relaxation um and yoga itself the way that i was doing it was really slowing down my valve system in a lot of ways and so i wasn't really getting to the access of full life force that i could feel was possible for me that i could feel that was like under the surface and i kept telling people even though the kind of yoga i did was all about the pelvic floor uh, i kept feeling like there's there's just some there's like because i need more pelvis i need more pelvic floor. I need, I need something that's coming from underneath me. Mm -hmm. So the activation part is like most of my, the people that I work with, they don't need to learn how to relax. They need to be able to tolerate life force energy and a lot more of it. They need to be okay with higher arousal states, whether that's sexually or with money or, um, so the capacity to hold more. So when I'm thinking about SOAS, I'm thinking of what I call rewilding is actually having an expression from the core. And over the 42 years I've worked with people, I've come to recognize what I call the frozen spine. 
In other words, I see it in many of the forms of fitness, in yoga, as it's practiced here in the Western world. Um, now I'm not talking about, you know, that it can't be different or that some people teach differently, but I see a way of controlling the core through sometimes masking through the abdominals, sometimes masking through the quiet stillness of being conscious. Um, I see it in all kinds of ways, but that's not our animal body. That's, a, that's an overlay of a cultural belief system that says our spine is a column. And so when I'm working, I'm working to activate the primal responses, which of course people are terrified of. They, they think that means I'm gonna lose control, I'm gonna be, you know, this, I'm gonna rip my clothes off, you know, and run down the street, which may not be a bad thing to do, but uh, nevertheless, you know, like somehow you can almost feel the fear by even talking about primal responses. So how do you play with that idea of activating and tolerating more sensation, more capacity to be alive? What, what do you do to Yeah, to I agree that, that it, is, it can be scary. I, I just turned in another book and the, the scariest in quotes part of the book comes in the seventh chapter where I suggest that people growl and like the, the publishers are just like, they are just like, what are you talking about? So it's a step-by-step -step process that, you know, the, the nature of how a lot of people learn and how we're taught to learn is that we have to go like a step-by-step -step thing and I'm going to tell you how it goes. Like sometimes I'll just take a breath and then I'll sigh or I'll hum like, hmm. And then I'll be doing that and then somebody like, Oh, the humming. Humming is a really good practice. Humming is like a parasympathetic, you know, vagal nerve activation. We should really like humming, you know. Um, so I do suggest things um, to lift the inhibition, right? So however the, the voice wants to express itself, however the body wants to express itself, but I, I, because I come from the somatic experiencing world that was really based on wild animal behavior. I just used this uh, model of predator and prey because I recognize that so many of the women that I worked with, they could be the prey, but they couldn't be the predator. And I was just very surprised by that because even in, an, in a quote unquote acting way, like I'm like, we're safe, we're in my office or in my dome or in my living room. And I'm just saying, hey, why don't you be the wolf and I'll be the rabbit? And they're like, they can't be the wolf. And they start acting like the rabbit at the suggestion of being the wolf. <laughs> and so then I notice, wow, it's not that they don't want to do that. It's that they actually physiologically can't do that. And so how I do that is I teach people to stalk. I teach people to track something with their eyes. I teach people how to get on all fours. You know, some of it is pretty straightforward it's what you would probably do if you were a kid and you were just like let's get on the ground and like now we're at the watering hole okay now you're this one now and we would uh -huh. be able to to roll switch yeah yeah good yeah that's fun so you know one of the things i think we both like doing and when we talked together that one day uh what we did do was play right so play uh, is part of the you know sympathetic response so even though on one level we're playing you know with this um uh, being a predator for example there is playfulness in being a predator there is a game uh, you know i i live uh, part some of my time with her and uh, when I'm with her, you know, her games are so like, I don't know if she's going to eat me or she's just going to kiss me, you know, like, like I, it's a play and she's not going to tell you which one she's going to do. And it's fun. And I'm, cause on many levels I do trust her. Right. And I also do trust myself. So, so we, you know, when you're in the capacity to work with other people and play, I feel like that's part of that primal response. And I know you like to play a lot. So tell me more about how, how do you play? How do you suggest women play? How do you play as, as that, you know, like that role playing like we did? We actually did some of that in, in our class. So that was really fun to, 
to watch and to be part of. And how far people will go or not go has a lot to do with trust, right? And consent. So maybe this is where we enter into this idea of, you know, how you play as an adult now, uh, which so many people have been trained not to play anymore and not to not to toy with someone else, so to speak. And yet that's part of a sexual expression is to play. So speak to that. Yeah. I don't play as much as I might like to, uh, <laughs> but I was just in the park right before we talked and my daughter has been feeling really um, listless because she says she's tired and we keep arguing because I'm like, you're not tired because you haven't done anything today. You're listless because you don't have any energy because we haven't moved enough. So, you know, she's a preteen, so she's not really that fond of my whole analysis, but mm -hmm. she did come to the park. And then we were, at, we were at the park, we were playing a little racket thing, and then I was jumping rope, and I said, like, come jump rope. And I think jumping rope is fun. So jumping rope, trying, I was trying to double, double do it and only jump once, which I couldn't do, but I was just trying different rhythms, and then I was skipping and jumping and jumping backwards and jumping forwards and seeing if I could jump to the side. And then what she would do is she came right next to me like a sandwich. So we were like almost nose to nose and to see if she could jump together with me. So once oh, it was fun. a game and she could do it together, she goes, I don't know why I'm laughing. I'm kind of afraid. I don't know why I'm laughing. And I'm like, it's okay. Like, we'll just try it. We might make a mistake or you, you know, but it, it's not going to hurt. So I uh, just, curiosity and experimentation and the way the first way I found the Jaguar work was through playing with her because she was really dominating me when she was like five years old and a, a person that I was working with said you you need to be the Jaguar like Jaguar moms are the ones that teach their cubs how to hunt so you need to do that and so I would dominate her physically by wrestling with her and then pinning her down and like pressing her head into the ground to let her physically know that I could take charge in that I would. And she still likes doing that sometimes. Uh, uh, that, yeah, yeah. Well, contact, squeezing, you know, playing boa constrictor. Um, there's all kinds of games that you can play around that. Um, the, the piece that that's interesting to me is that, that w when you were talking about, you know, the play, there, there is a danger in play. There's an innate danger in play. And, and in Mother Nature understands that. And yet play is imperative for all mammals. So if we don't play, our nervous system isn't really honed. And one of the ways we learn our capacity is this, is this play. And I was thinking about the wolf, the wolf mother who uh, doesn't take her child, doesn't allow the cubs to come out and hunt with her you know, and tells them to go back to the cave. And I was thinking about how interesting her body language must be because they actually do stay there, even without her as she goes out to hunt. So, so there is this kind of also field of energy that she presents. It's not just her, what she does when she's there. She's also creating a field of what Porges would call co-regulation. And one of the things that I find in my work is the lack of co-regulation that happened in our childhood stimulates what I call the uh, opiated state in which the listlessness or the, and I'm not saying that's what your daughter's doing, but often our sense of that either listlessness or disassociation or, I mean, teenagers are naturally that way, but we grow out of it, right? And hopefully. and um, and we, we are able to activate this fire, this passion. Uh, and sometimes it's through the anger we feel as a teen. Sometimes it's a, it's a finding thing that is, you're passionate about and, and all of a sudden really connecting to the heart. So part of this heart field is a, is a resonance or a transmission. And uh, many of us did not get that. So I think I'm curious how you create coherency or that sense of regulation 
we hear a lot about self-regulation, but it stems from having been co-regulated. You know, mama bear sees the baby flailing, comes, grabs the baby, puts it like you did, kind of creates a pressure on the body that holds the body saying, I am here and I'm holding you. So in a way, it's, you could look at it as dominance, but you could also look at it as support and as nourishment and as regulation because weight does that of some kind as long as it doesn't suffocate you it's you know it could be really good um containment you know all those kind of words of creating containment so when we don't have that what i see in the world of psoas is a big message because to land and locate is the most important thing our organism needs to do as far as psoas is concerned and so I want to hear some how your strategies around coherency. What have you discovered with the world of creating coherency for yourself when in fact maybe you didn't get all those elements from your wild mother? Hmm. I'm not quite sure about that, but I am curious about play having inherent danger and i think maybe another way of saying that is is having risk and mm -hmm. so much of our contemporary life is about minimizing risk and and how and and even within consent the consent language is so directed towards like now the the sort of catch word is in, an enthusiastic yes but like Cece wasn't really an enthusiastic yes to jumping inside the rope together because she was kind of like, oh, but she wanted to, but it wasn't enthusiastic. It was actually a very reserved yes, but she was still in consent. So I'm curious about how consent works in all types of relationships uh, when, when actually pushing an envelope or creating capacity for more activation usually does require a fair degree of discomfort um but it can be like delicious discomfort you know it's mm -hmm. like that discomfort that you're like oh but this could be like so good on the other side or i could just flick that switch wherever that switch is and we're, we're on the other side of it right or then oh that actually really freaking hurt but it was still interesting it still got my attention and it still made me feel alive. Um, one of the ways that I created coherence over the last 10 years since my daughter was about two is that I recognize that mirroring is part of my erotic blueprint and being witnessed in many, many different kinds of ways. So one of those is photography. So I realized that in this last month and I'd been in quarantine, I was going to have a new class and usually I would take new pictures and I was sort of feeling bummed because that process for me of make it's making art. It's making a representation of what I do that then I can write from. And so then I thought, well, let me just call Miranda, the person I usually shoot pictures with. And so we did a photo shoot where we set up our iPhones and she took a picture of the phone. And so it's like three shots removed but i but it was play it was like i don't know let's see if we can do this like this is nuts and like this might not work but it actually might but so what do we have to lose right so mm -hmm. um yeah experimentation with the things that i know mm -hmm. create that sense of connection and newness for me yeah, so you've entered the world of creativity, and creativity to me is the parasympathetic. Um, not that there can't be risk or that there can't be something scary about it, but it's actually, um, to me, it is the innovation. So one of my philosophies uh, is that, you know, we have a strong urge for a homeostasis, um, and, a, and, an, and that's, you know, something that's necessary for thriving in life is to have a be, have certain things that we know how to do and we can repeat them and we can get dressed and you know drive our cars or whatever it is that it is that makes life a little simpler but we also have a strong need to innovate and innovation is entering the unknown what i don't 
No. So you don't know if those photos are going to work. You don't know what's going to come of it. But it was playful to do it, and it was fun. And all of a sudden, it's a kind of creative process that opens you up to something you would have not thought about doing before. Maybe the conditions created that. Maybe one of you were sparked to see something. And so all of a sudden, there's something new showing up. And to me, that is the flourishing of the organism, that it has the capacity to keep playing. And one of the things that's weird for me is that I'm in this field of talking about psoas, but I'm not a body worker and I'm not a, um, I'm not a therapist and I'm not interested in healing. Uh, not that I don't think healing's a great thing, but I'm not a healer. Uh, I'm a conceptual artist. And so I actually entered this realm of, co of embodiment through understanding that um, I was the art, art piece, so to speak, um, that I was what I was making life with, and, and that um, the more I could enter the sensory system, the more I could actually sense myself and experience myself, the more creative I would become. So I feel like you are a very creative person. I, I find you very playful and kind of, uh, uh, an inspiration in the sense of just, you know, life is the game that must be played, you know, and so you're kind of game to see what happens. So what do you notice? About, like, how does that play out for you? Like, you know, in, tell people how that happens for you, because you have mm -hmm. a, you have a joyfulness around play that is, you know, spontaneous and I think contagious. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not afraid to change my mind, so I'm not afraid to say something and then down the road be like that, I don't believe that anymore, or I learned something different and now I think this. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that gives me a lot of leeway. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in my earlier life, I was more of a perfectionist and I was afraid to say the right, the wrong thing. Now I just am like, okay, well, it's just one day, one moment. I said that thing, like I could be wrong, but I could be right too. Um, and I, well, I love people. So that's just, I think that might, I don't know if that's a personality quality, but I just actually really do love people. So I find, I find people hilarious. I find culture hilarious. And um, it's part of what I'm really missing right now is just like, that's what I love living in New York. I love walking down the street and seeing five different, hearing five different languages and, you know, yeah. di different, different proximities that people walk with each other and how those, I just find it all totally energizing. Uh, so yeah, I think, and, and I, I do have a really, and, and in somatic experiencing, we're always asking this question, like, how do you know that? So like, if I say I feel good or I feel that, well, how do you know that you feel good? And those questions are hard for me to answer, but what I do know is that I, I have a very close relationship with my intuition. And so and I don't know where my intuition is in my body at all times. There's just, I do have a knowing that's like, go in this direction or don't go in that direction. Uh, and so that also is really, I can really rely on that for everything from money to sex to, um, you know, educating my child. Uh, but I think that what you were saying, I lost my train of thought, but. There's actually a lot of activity outside of my window today, which there well, hasn't what's, been what's, at all. Wow. Yeah, because yeah. you're, you're in New York. Yeah. I know. But it's like people haven't been outside, and today's the first day people are in their backyards and throwing soccer balls over and stuff like that. The, um, the idea of sensation. So the sensory system is really important to me. And, and, uh, and I feel like that is how we land and locate. That's how a wild animal. So, so when people want to understand the psoas and they they have a psoas issue, I, I tell them the psoas is a messenger. It's it's not the problem. So don't shoot the messenger. What's missing is a connection with bone. 
with connection with ground, with landing. Because when we can land in our bones, like the wild animal, there is an orientation that begins to happen of locating in the time and place we're in. And when we can show up in time and place, then you can observe all these things that are happening. And the, the, there is no necessarily fear response. And if there is, it's usually an appropriate fear response. And so I feel that people, because they haven't landed, and I do consider this part of the birth story, uh, that people don't totally land in. Uh, and we talked about this, the idea of the, the birth being traumatic when, in fact, birth is not a traumatic event. Um, it has become one. But it is, and that, but that is to me the cultural story of birth, not Mother Nature's story of birth. And uh, and when baby lands in the wild, they land on the earth. You know, they land here on the earth, whereas we land, uh, you know, in plastic gloves, and we land in, you know, or at least culturally, and we land in floating environments where we don't actually feel ground. Babies are carried around in plastic baskets. <clears throat> I say like a piece of chicken. Um, yeah, there's not a sense of ground, of land, of earth, of connection. And I feel for myself, that is how we access um, the, wild, the wild agency that is our birthright. So what do you recommend for landing and locating? Like, how did you, because you established a good in sense of intuition, and I consider intuition the, the wild, that wild, those wild instincts. Are there some things or tips or ways that you look at that or teach about that? Mm -hmm. So one thing I wanted to say too about what, what you were mentioning before about not coming as a healer or a therapist. I mean, I think that that's, also part of why there might be a different feeling because I don't like, I don't, I like, I use the word trauma kind of cause I have to, but not because I'm like so interested in trauma because I just don't really actually care so much about the specifics of trauma. Mm -hmm. I care about facilitating a space where someone could finally come into their unique expression and have the capacity to be spontaneous or to find their own artistic nature. So I'm, I'm like, I'm kind of bored of trauma and, and that probably comes through because I just don't really, it's a way of talking about, of framing something that is, we could call it habit. We could call it conditioning. We could call it, um, I've heard some people call it imprints. Not, you're not your, it's not your blueprint. It's your imprint, but all of the things that are, stuck to us over what would block just that ability to be creative and to interface with other people and have that third third thing come to life that was different yes. than those individual things or that um thing so for landing and locating uh you know i really do work with these very specific ways of looking at the branches of the nervous system and so for instance if i'm working on a flight response I'll do things like shuffling the soles of the feet against the floor to like really feel the friction of the feet. Mm -hmm. okay. And then um, using the feet one at a time in a walking action as we're doing some mobilization of freeze responses through sounds. Um, I love doing, I'm really super into the coronal plane. I just, I think it's, even when I say it, it just makes me feel incredible when I start to really imagine where that center ear, center shoulder, center hip is and like that whole lateral definition. I feel like when we establish what usually is called back body mm -hmm. um, and we can feel the dimension that's behind our, what we, how we normally interface with you know, viscera forward, face forward, sensory organs forward, and we right. start to feel, which to me is so as that back body is so as expression. Uh, so I, I do a lot with that, whether that's how we orient our eyes in our orbits or how, how our tongue is, where our um, sphenoid pituitary is located through tracking and just getting that dimensional awareness. 
and then literal eye orientation so that you're actually confirming not only what you're sensing that's behind you, but that you, that you're sensing and your proprioception is accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I work a lot with proprioception as you, as you know, and, um, <clears throat> and that is what the psoas is messaging is a disruption in proprioception. Um, that is part of because the psoas is associated with the fear response. Then when people are having uh, psoas uh, information coming up and they think, oh, it's my psoas, or I'm afraid I have to do something to my psoas. No, the psoas is telling you that you're there. You're not getting the right information. You're not getting all the information. You're not accurately picking it up. And that to the wild animal means you'll be eaten. You know, you you will be you will be caught, you know, so to speak, um, you'll be taken down because they, you, you need all those, you need the back body, you need the side bodies, you need the, you know, under your feet, you need the top of your head, you need inside, you know, so the sensory system, the development of sensory system, and I spent years developing my sensory system uh, as my strategy uh, or as my journey into embodiment was to track uh, what was I sensing and what was associated with that sensation? For example, I noticed uh, an image would come up or a memory or uh, an emotion or, uh, and, and what I would start to notice was, <coughs> excuse me, that the sensation is just a sensation, but what it's linked to, I could pay attention to, or I could actually stay with the sensation. And when I stayed with the sensation, it would often lead me to another sensation, another sensation. And conceptually, because I am very conceptual, I would start to go, oh, wow, look at the relationships between, the, you know, part of me is like observing my sensory process. And that was really exciting uh, because I did it in, in, in constructive rest a lot. So I actually had the capacity to be grounded while I was doing it. So even if I noticed that, oh, my hip socket is tight and tight tension means like there's feels like something is being held or being uh, dense or, you know, and I would describe the sensation, but then I get an image and, you know, years ago it would be an image of my father and, uh, you know, I'd get the thought I'd like to kick him, you know, and then I'd laugh um, eventually, uh, either that or cry, but, um, you know, or kick. Uh, um, but like I started to make connections and all of a sudden, you know, one day I realized, you know, I sense my hip sockets and there's nobody there and there isn't a story. And that's been an incredible journey to inhabit myself without story. <laughs> um, that's really fun. That's just showing up in time and space in this moment with no uh, baggage, so to speak, or no other pulls mm -hmm. out of you know, and, and that's just uh, glorious, but that process takes time. Um, yeah. So yeah. I've done that process, but not really so much so as a solo journey. I mean, I had a 10 year yoga practice where it was a lot of internal mapping, but not so much uh -huh. associative, but then I did most of that work with uncoupling sensations, emotions, images, movements with practitioners through somatic experiencing. So I think um, I'm not, I don't, I, I am a quote unquote, I, I don't even believe in discipline. So I was going to say discipline. I don't really care about discipline, but I am a person who can stick with something that I'm interested in, but I don't really enjoy doing lots and lots of things alone. So I, I would, I just always had another person or practitioner there as a witness. Although I do find that when I'm doing that work with other people where we're parsing out we get to the part where we can parse those things out that my own system also gets. Like I just posted an image on Instagram of these owls. They're so cute. They're rocking all together, the owls. And that's mm -hmm. what happens with me when I enter into what I consider like I'm in the, a deeper mm -hmm. layer of the nervous system where something's actually shifting with someone else. Then my system starts to rock. Um, and that's like my signal. Okay. Like I'm in the right layer here where something's actually going to like transform and, um, move. Right. And I think, you know, I mean, I started, when I started the work, I started it with a group of people. 
Um, mm. So I also was in a group of people. So yeah, I worked with Bob Cooley, who's introduced me to the seller. And, uh, and so while I was also a conceptual artist, I was also took this class. And so for three years, I, I really explored that with, with a group of people. But I also spent a lot um, of time alone, not as something I should do, because I think we both have that same strategy. I, I'm not interested in drama, um, although it ends up a conversation a lot, and I know a lot about it. Um, but I also um, uh, can adventure into like just getting very quiet and allowing that process to unfold inside of me. But I think at first, it, it was really rich to be in a field with other people because I see that rocking as a field work, that when we start to have a, a, a frequency that we're really actually creating a co-creating co something that's a regulatory system by the a consciousness that each of us have. So when I'm teaching a workshop and we're all making a sound or different sounds, but we're working with only a couple, there's nothing to startle us. But at the same time, if I'm not doing anything, but just hanging around going, I'm not even sure I'm interested in this. The other sounds can often move me out of being uh, kind of bored or complacent or, uh, you know, like lost or, and, and it starts to create this support. So I agree that, like, you know, there's there's a place there's a place for both and and many of us are looking for that co-regulation where we don't have to do all the work ourselves and I'm yeah. not disciplined at all. Um. <laughs> One of the things that I needed to do also because for me some of the some of the layers that I was bringing in were specifically with male authority figures uh -huh. is that I needed to actually have a male practitioner to work with so that that. Um, because I, my, I felt a different level of danger around a man. And so I needed to actually have that to project on and to relate to in session to be able to unravel some of those couplings that were in my own system. Well, it's interesting because one of the things I hear several times I've heard you say is that you put yourself in a situation that created kind of going back to our original conversation when you said, you know, that we're, we're kind of looking to not be in danger rather than tolerate a level of danger. And here you're bringing that back because most people say, oh, I'm not going to work, you know, with a man because I've had experiences with men and that's too scary. And here you're saying, no, I chose to be in a situation that was actually allowed me to explore the danger that might be elicited from this relationship how did you know how did you how do you know the difference I, I for people listening how do you know the difference between repeating the pattern which we've talked about those patterns how do you know the difference between repeating the pattern and choosing someone who is actually can hold space so that you can explore it but not repeat the pattern it's a great question. I, I waited a while to figure out who the right person was. Um, so I didn't just go like, I need a male therapist and then I'm just going to take the next one that comes along. Mm -hmm. um, I chose somebody who had very, so uh, another thing about like trauma work or therapy is like, I don't usually relate to the people that are coming from the psychological perspective. So this particular person that I worked with is a ballroom dancer, martial artist, um, yoga teacher, but he was also studying psychology. And um, I knew I needed somebody with the understanding. I mean, we used to do things like he would get out a broomstick and then he would, it would be my job to duck under the broomstick or get around it. And, and he, but he was much bigger than me. So he could trap me with the broomstick too. And we both knew it but we were doing it in the name of creating a, a larger sense of safety. So I needed to also know that this person, yeah, that we shared some kind of um, common, not belief system, but approach, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I knew I wasn't repeating something uh, was because I think sometimes when you're repeating something, you kind of have that weird addictive feeling like you want to do it 
Whereas in this case, I didn't actually really want to do it. Like my personality was like, this is fucking scary. And I don't really want to go do this. But the deeper part of me was like this, if you want to, if you want to really do this, this is what you need to do kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So I wasn't really compelled to do it. I was like magnet or maybe I was not magnetized to it. I was compelled to do it. It was a deeper level of, of like, yeah, I just knew, okay, I, I can sit here in a room with any woman and we can just keep doing this, but I'm not going to get to this other stuff that I know is inherent to this power dynamic that's, that feels really scary. The first session, he was somebody that I knew socially a little bit, not a lot. And I sat there, all I said was like, I came here to work on limits and boundaries. I didn't even say anything about the content, anything. And I just bawled for, and I was just like, I don't even know why I'm crying. And like, when I could even talk and then I was shaking. And so, uh, yeah, I find the really good sessions are the ones that, you know, work, but you don't know why they work. And that's how I felt when I was working with him. Like, this is really working. And I don't, I don't even need to understand why I can just feel that my system is changing. So let's talk about that. Cause I think that's a, that's an animal instinct. Um, uh, to to uh, know the difference between to be able I mean we're we're talking about discernment, <clears throat> which is a, a you know like a wolf trait. They're very discerning. So so the discernment between uh, you know like what I tell people is that if they go to their chiropractor and they keep getting their psoas adjusted or whatever they're you know getting you know fi fixed. <laughs> And they have to come back a week later to do it, right? You know, my neck is out, so I go and they, it helps a lot. But in a week, I have to go do it again. That if you're repeating that, there is no change. That, that's, that's not change. That's, that's someone supporting a, a, a recapitulation of, a, of a, a, an event. Change is where each time something shifts where what you're working on the next time is not the same thing. It's not back. It's like another layer or another piece. Or, so how do you discern that difference in yourself? Because you, you're saying, I have these good instincts. Try to verbalize what, how do you actually discern that, okay, this is actually good. This feels good. I'm something inside knows, even though it's scary, that this, this is actually good. This is medicine. Hmm. Well, I look at the rest of my life and how I am in the rest of my life and what I'm up for, you know, what, what I'm drawn to the rest of the time. So, uh, that's really the main thing. Like, am I showing up for my life in a way that feels more alive? But what specifically? That's a pretty good one. You know that. I mean, these are ways that you're like, you know, it's easier giving, for me to you're identify. Giving cues, you're giving clues to how do you notice that in yourself? Well, like with clients, I'm looking that like some, like I had a client who she was coming to me at first, and she drove this car that was like she was always worried it was going to break down. It was like the biggest, it was like the worst beater car I've ever seen in my life. Like I, I was like, I don't think if she sold it, she could sell it for literally $150. Like I couldn't even believe it was working. And then after two sessions, she felt comfortable enough and secure enough to buy a car that she could actually take and she knew it would get her somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. But like most people that wouldn't really come up in a therapy session because that wouldn't be considered like we would be worried about if we got to the root of the problem or like whatever. But like I'm just looking at functionality, you know, like do I am I available for more of the things that I want to be available for? And for me, it's kind of simple because, you know, as a single parent for a long time, it was like there's no way that I can do X because I don't have enough energy for that. Um, I can't divide myself in that way. So. Mm -hmm. I knew it was working because it's like, wow, okay, now I feel more centered. I feel more, and for me, it's a feeling of consolidation because I tend to be very 
like it feels like the molecules of me are very disparate and my molecules need to come closer together. So for me, it feels like I get like a super saturated experience of myself rather than a kind of diffuse pixelated experience. And so that density to me feels very helpful and useful. Wow, that's so interesting. For me, it's the opposite. Yeah, I think. Yeah, you can probably guess that. Yeah. And that I start feeling porous. And so I feel more available and more responsive to what's around me. I notice more. I'm more, you know, it, it's, a, it's not dispersing, but it's porousness. I become porous. So things are moving through me and passing through me and moving me. So I feel more moved by life both internally and, you know, just life itself. So, uh, so all of a sudden there's porousness. So fascinating that, you know, we, you come to the same thing, but you come to it in your own. Well, and I would say that that's connective way. tissue related. So I would say that you have more collagen in your connective tissue proportionally, and I have more elastin in my connective tissue. So therefore your tissue predisposes you to more sympathetic responses and mine predisposes me to more parasympathetic. And so when we're looking at how those relate, I mean, you can tell just by when we talk to each other, like you're so much more direct, you're faster, you like get right to it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, like, hold on, let, let me <laughs> take a deep <laughs> breath and think about this. I'm not really sure, you know, and so, um, when we're really far on those spectrums and I tend to work with a lot of parasympathetically dominant people because those people tend to be um, drawn to yoga and dance and the things that require a lot of flexibility. And then it's much harder for them to gather themselves back together and to gather the tissue back together. But so many of those forms are made for people that are more collagenous because it's like, let's stretch so that you can feel yourself more, to feel that the, the fibers are actually pulling apart and there's not so, the, the electrical conductivity comes through there. So in the, when you're elastinous, it's like those signals are actually traveling faster. So there's more information coming faster. Good to know, good to know. That's my... I, no, I know, that's great. I, I, um... I mean, part of psoas issues for uh, for everybody is the issue of um, uh, hi hypermobility, and because hypermobility or hyperflexibility has grown uh, in the forty years I've been teaching, you know, it used to be one or oh, two interesting. Now, oh, yeah, it's it's and and it is associated uh if you want to track it into the hypermobility and i mean real hypermobility not just you know kind of maybe what you're referring to but actually truly hypermobility like circus or like you know hypermobility which i work with people from there um what happens to hypermobile people with their psoas is that they basically you know the kidneys ride on the psoas so, so, and the adrenals, well, they float actually, not ride. So the floating of it means that if you don't have a juicy psoas, you're really straining those kidney adrenals. And, and what happens to someone who tends to be hypermobile is that they often engage psoas to feel more collected or centered. So they're actually using it rather than finding the bones, finding the joints, but because the proprioception is disrupted when your ligaments are a little too, you know, responsive. So you're not getting those signals proprioceptively. So that's a really, you know, that's again, a, 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 a really affects people so as in the sense that, and then their kidneys and adrenals. So the, the far side of that for people is that they have um, adrenal exhaustion. And the nervous system becomes hypersensitive to light and sound and things like that. So one of the things I'm looking for when people are in that direction with my work is to how to get them again in their bones so that the density of bone, but the vibration of bone, and that's where I too use a lot of sound. So I love the fact that you're using sound 
to vibrate, uh, and you may be using it differently as expression, but let's talk a little bit, uh, we are coming kind of to the end, but I want to talk a little bit more about sound and how you see sound in the purpose of awakening our animal instincts, the inner jaguar. How do you play with sound? I think since I came, this all emerged for me together with motherhood and birthing. At first it was really coming out of how surprised some people are by the sounds that they make when they're birthing mm -hmm. and wanting to allow people to explore the possibilities of what that would be or feel like because uninhibited expression and the vocalization part of it is so much a part of just moving energy and, and allowing whatever is to be to be to be overtaken to be to allow yourself to be overwhelmed right for me overwhelm was a word that i used to just use all the time because i used to cry i still cry a lot but i used to cry way more than i do now and then if my parents would say what's wrong i would always just say i'm just so overwhelmed um and that's a parasympathetic thing by the way like a sympathetic dominant person would say i'm just irritated or frustrated like they're irritated and frustrated much much of the time whereas the parasympathetics are like i'm just so overwhelmed i've said that word not really recently very much but in my life i that's probably the word i've said <laughs> the most I'm, i i want to find another one that i've said just as much of that but i've i said that a lot for quite some time uh my word was intense intense <laughs> <laughs> Everything I must have intense. said that a million times. Yes, it's just really fucking intense. <laughs> it's all really intense. <laughs> That's what I said in the middle of labor. I I like the I barely spoke, but like the one time I was in transition, she's like, "How's it going?" I'm like, "This is really intense." And she's like, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah so sound so it sounds um, sound i mean i was i was a chanter so that was my thing i okay. memorized lots of sanskrit i love sanskrit it came very easily to me um mm -hmm. and still a mantra will just come into my awareness at different times so i've always been and i love to sing so i just have always i mean it brings me immense joy to harmonize with people um yeah, so it's, for me, that's just part of me, but it's also as far as, you know, because the, I think one of the hard, the hardest state to, to work with is freeze, because freeze requires a lot of time to unfreeze. And like, you can't take a frozen chicken out of the freezer and make it thaw out any faster. Although I've tried and I'm, I'm a bit <laughs> of a wreck in the kitchen. So, um, I believe me if you could figure out how to do that I would have because uh, I'm always forgetting things about that so um, sound is like for me the most effective way to begin that process um, mm -hmm. I do yeah, I agree uh, just like you know let a sound come out on your exhale people are usually and joining co-regulation it's like people are like I don't know if I want to do that you can, they don't say it usually, but you can tell they're like, I'm not sure I want to do that alone. But if you say we're going to do it together, then it's like, oh, okay. And then if they can tell that I don't care if they laugh or if, if they think it's lame and, the, and that I'm going to actually reflect that back to them, if that's their response in, yeah. in a playful way, then yeah. they're willing to keep going in that direction. And I also think that people appreciate that, yes, they are coming to me to work with like some really dark shit sometimes but that in the process of doing that it doesn't have it's it not only does it not have to be like down in the doldrums dark pit territory that it actually can't be if we're going to do the work we need to do mm -hmm. so it requires that i'm in that ping pong back and forth um somewhat playful space and you know i mean i'm kind of notorious in fact i had an apprentice here recently and I realize it's very vulnerable to have somebody watching in session because I just, I've done so many sessions without anyone ever seeing what I do or watching. And then I realize, I mean, I'll just burst out laughing in session. Like 
Somebody will make, if it's, if I think it's funny, like I don't like try to be serious and like keep a prep, you know, a therapist face. I just like burst out laughing, you know, or sometimes people just wind themselves up in a knot and I just start to laugh. Um, so I guess I also just feel like it's like the human permission to not be yeah, in the, the role. Thing. Yeah. But to just be myself. So the sound yeah. is through the reflection. It's also part of how I mobilize the enteric nervous system. So if somebody has lots of gut issues, IBS, um, then the, to me, like getting that vibrational quality in the intestines and in the pelvis is something that I'm looking for. Oh, me too. I work a lot because, you know, so as interfaces, all these different nervous systems. So, I mean, to me on one level, there are no separations to the nervous system, but I know that, you know, through the, the, the research and stuff, we've articulated all these different nervous systems, but yes, the gut brain is so intimate with psoas and opening the gut brain and the primal tube because the primal tube is the expression that so as is really, I, I tell people the center of their body is, is like a caterpillar. And, and that, you know, if you, if you lock down one part of the caterpillar, the rest is gonna flail, right? You know, if, if you watched a caterpillar who's one end move differently than the other end, you'd like be really concerned. You know, there's something fucking wrong with that caterpillar. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know what's wrong with that caterpillar, but you know, God, um, you know, but yet that's what we do with our head to our tail. So I work with tail to tongue. And I work with this idea of, of opening that tube and, and even doing ancestral work because you can make sounds that allow the gut to make sounds that we call them the ancestral you know, voices where they, they start to move. And I'm amazed what shows up for people in terms of lightness, in terms of health, in terms of feeling you know, more whole. Same with the O-rings. I work a lot with the O-rings. Uh, for that same reason, and sound, of course, vibrates the O-ring. So you're, you're looking at not only the diaphragms, but you're looking at these um, tissue that we call O-rings or sphincter muscles. And when we wake that up, you, I can feel how the, the, there's a sense of center to your being that is awake now, you know, that, that you're moving from that center, which we know is literally true but to actually sense that awakening um so i'm, I'm happy to hear that because i i so agree what's the difference for you between the o-rings and the the tube the o-rings are the sphincters around the tube so, okay, so but the they tube. include the eyes too so this there's sphincter muscles around the eyes so when we go into that level of like surprise you know like Surprise can be because of fear, but surprise can be because of joy. And so sphincters move in expression. And when I see that people's sphincters are <laughs> stuck, so to speak, um, you, you know, you're seeing the expression not correlate with the experience or not give you information. So if you're reading someone else's experience, you know, you, can, you can't tell. And that's incoherency in my world because if you can't tell, you know, when we look at an animal, you know, and the tail is tucked, I tell people, if you tuck your tail, think of what an animal is like when they tuck their tail. What does that mean? You know the meaning of what it is. When the human tucks their tail or they lock their eyes or, you know, and they smile and they're angry. It's like, we're getting, we can't actually read what's, what, what is really going on with this? We can feel the incoherency. We might even be able to kind of know there's incoherency, but it's very hard to know our own incoherency. So I can read it in someone else, but do I know my own incoherency? You know? So I think working like you are from the, you know, these, these playful ways offers so much for people to um, dynamically start to sense the core of their being. You know? and, to me, that is the message of what Soas is always saying, is that, am I coherent, am I not? Am I safe or am I not? Hmm. So as we kind of come to a close, I want to offer you space to just say some things that might be pertinent that you want to share in this conversation around wild agency. 
like, you know, we're waking up our animal instincts for what reason? To have agency, to be self-empowered, to express ourselves as living organisms. What, anything you want to bring to that conversation? Hmm. I feel like we're at a unique moment right now that's been building where we have this extreme polarity between maturation and individuation. Mm -hmm. And it's really, we've got the heat turned up pretty high right now in having to do that in closed quarters in whatever living arrangements that we've chosen to have. And then at the same time, recognizing an interdependence that's way broader than most people have ever felt into because how we behave is going to be influencing. And, you know, people used to say things about like the butterfly or, you know, all those like sort of cliches that I'm sure are true and sometimes inspiring for some people. Um, but <laughs> and, and, um, it's, and it's physics. Oh, just to throw that in there. Okay. Yeah. But go ahead. <laughs> uh, I think that um, yeah, the, the purpose is so that we can live in relationship harmoniously with all of the sentient beings, humans and other and otherwise. And when we're out of that so as integrity, we're out of a, our own sense of center. We lose a sense, an ability to have actual connection and actual relationship. We might think we're having it, but we're not. We're relating those things that are left over in our hip are relating to the things that are left over in someone else's shoulder that are left over here. And it's rippling out into creating structures and power systems. And, you know, I'm... Ultimately, I'm really interested in social justice is, is really where I started and where I came from. Um, yeah, speak to that because most people I don't think know that about you or maybe they do with who have taken your courses. But, you know, I, when we sat down for dinner and you, you know, I was sharing my interest in social justice and so were you. As I, you know, that's a piece people don't, I don't know if they know. So, yeah, something more about that. I mean, the first big topic of interest that I ever had was the civil rights movement. And that's how I came to yoga was through learning about James Core and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the South. And so when I went to college, I went to school for social policy and African American studies and specifically studying principles of of the movement of the nonviolence. What was that? What were the Gandhian principles that came here through James Core and how that how did that transmute and become the movement and then what's happening now so in college I also volunteered at the Chicago Algebra Project which was about bringing all children algebra by the eighth grade which is usually the differentiating marker for who can go to college so the person Bob Moses who is the head of the student nonviolent coordinating committee he developed curriculum with African drums and sub subway stops that was very experiential for the for those people to be able that population of kids in the South side of Chicago to be able to learn and have then access into higher levels of education. And now I'm working more with women's health, but ultimately like, so this Jaguar class that I'm starting this week that you're going to teach part of, I recognize that um, I did bring a class in on racial justice, but as far as the jaguar even language because we're using language of wild animals it doesn't really it's white normative it doesn't really land in black bodies the same way because black bodies have already been treated like animals and referred to as animals and um they have already been caged literally so um it's I realized that I've been teaching some other students of color and right on the back of this, I'm mentoring someone to launch Black Jaguar. So there's going to be a whole other program that's specifically for people of color and women of color to work with these principles through the language. And, and honestly, some of it's very insulting for them to learn from a white person because a lot of these things like humming and singing, those were all already that's built all into the yeah. earth based tradition that their people were, they were take that was taken from them as they were taken from their land 
So um, as a white person, we have to be in our center to tolerate the next level, like basically where we're at is like, okay, we've, we've kind of come out of collective freeze where it's like, okay, this, and you know, it's a little frustrating for me because I've been in this conversation for like 30 years and now people are just like, oh yeah, you should read a book by a black author. It's like, yeah, okay. Um, that's a, that's a good start. Um, but in order for us to really have social justice, we need to be able to respect difference because we're differentiated enough to understand that difference doesn't have to mean separation. And, and that doesn't mean sep- like, yes, I am creating a separated course. I'm not trying to integrate the material. I'm creating a completely separate thing for people to do the, their homogenous work so that there's even potential to have actual dialogue that's not influenced by all of these, all of the past power dynamics. Right, that's great. Thank you for bringing that in. I'm actually at this moment also working with uh, uh, Natasha Stovell that we're, uh, who wrote a great piece on um, whiteness on the couch and we're working yes. with the white body uh, this month as well. Um, we would have been in New York doing it, but that wasn't possible. But yes, I'm, I'm very interested, and I'm very interested because I recognize also what that means for me and the limitations that the white body has brought uh, into its own core and the freeze that's still, I believe, there on uh, that we haven't really, I mean, we've, we're getting a little, you know, a little more movement there, but I'm still seeing um, a disconnect to understanding ourselves within a contextual understanding of, of all humans and what, why that is, you know. And so that's, we're working with that piece. Um, and as well as um, I highly recommend people get uh, my grandmother's hands from uh, Resma Menikam, who is an amazing author. So uh, just to throw that into the, the piece on, on what we're talking about. But thank you, I, I appreciate you doing that. And I'm really excited that you're doing that. Um, so I'm gonna stop at this point and thank you very much for, for joining me on my podcast series. Thank and, you. Yeah.